Greetings again. And we are going to look in this second lecture at the doctrine of justification in early Wesley. I am currently writing a full book on Wesley's doctrine of justification. And this lecture is taken from chapter 2 of the book. In 1765, Wesley published a landmark sermon called The Scripture Way of Salvation. And this sermon is considered a landmark sermon because it expresses his mature theology, um, his, his full understanding of the gospel, so to speak. And in that sermon, he speaks of two branches of the gospel, justification and sanctification. And in this lecture, we're going to look at justification. Now, when scholars and students of Wesley think about the doctrine of justification in Wesley's theology, they always focus on the post-1738 Wesley. Not the early Wesley. Not the Wesley in Oxford and Georgia. But the Wesley uh, from Aldersgate and thereafter. He becomes an evangelist. He and the doctrine of justification becomes very much a, a core element of his gospel message to the masses. And the reason is very simple, as I state here in the first paragraph. In 1738, Wesley became an evangelical. He was born again. He experienced a new birth under the leadership of the Moravians. And he adopted the Protestant Reformation's message of justification by faith alone. And so he starts to develop, from that point on, an evangelical doctrine of justification. We want to look at his doctrine of justification prior to this, before he was an evangelical. While he was a child in the parsonage, he grew up with educated Charterhouse, and later in Oxford, uh, was a leader of the Oxford Methodists, and was a missionary to Georgia. Wesley's early doctrine of justification second paragraph begins right here on the first page. What has not received sufficient attention is that Wesley already had a doctrine of justification before 1738. As we'll see, he first learned about justification as a child and youth, and it was the essential part of his soteriology during his time in Oxford and in Georgia. In this lecture, we will explore the early Wesley's doctrine of justification, identifying primary sources and explain its central tenets. Although space in this lecture does not allow for a study of its influence on his doctrine of righteousness beyond 1738, clearly, students of Wesley, people who read Wesley's writings or are aware of his teachings, will see connections. The place to begin is with Wesley's Anglican context. The religious milieu of Wesley's upbringing was in the high church tradition of the Church of England. Both his parents, Samuel and Susanna, conformed from descent to the Church of England during the late 17th century Anglican renewal and became devout high churchmen in their convictions. Wesley acknowledged his high church upbringing in later years to the Earl of Dartmouth. He says, I am a high churchman, the son of a high churchman, bred up from childhood in the highest notions of passive obedience and non-existence. Those were two, that was one of the aspects of high churchmanship, one of the qualities of high churchmanship in the 18th century, was passive obedience and non-resistance. On another occasion, Wesley explained he'd been raised in the high church tradition to love and reverence the scriptures, the church fathers, and the church of England, including all her doctrines and liturgy. In keeping with the historic faith of the church Catholic that reached back to Augustine, the church of England taught that justifying and regenerating grace is granted in the sacrament of baptism. The baptismal liturgy for infants defines the sacrament as, quote, the mystical washing away of sins. 
to sanctify with the Holy Ghost, that he or she, being delivered from God's wrath, may be received into the ark of Christ's church. That's from the Book of Common Prayer and the baptismal liturgy. After the child was baptized, the priest would declare, quote, the child is regenerate and grafted into the body of Christ's church and has become God's own child by adoption, unquote. The same language and themes are found in the baptismal liturgy for those of riper years. So the established church taught that the gift of justification, new birth, adoption, and union with Christ are initially granted in the sacrament of baptism. For high church Anglicans, like the Wesleys, justification involved two distinct moments. The initial gift of forgiveness at baptism and a final public declaration at the last judgment. See, it's called double justification. And in between was the work of regeneration and sanctification. The high church order of salutis could be outlined as follows. You have initial justification at baptism. Then you have the process of sanctification in the person's life. You have final justification at the last judgment. And then it goes on into eternal glory, the eternal kingdom. Notice this progression. The Anglican order of salvation, the Ordo Salutis. This is very important. You have baptism, sanctification, last judgment, eternal glory. That's the believer's path to the kingdom and in salvation. At baptism is the initial justification and regeneration. And in the Anglican Church, they baptize infants. John Wesley was baptized when he was like eight, nine days old. So he, he was regenerated in his baptism. Okay, we'll come talk about more about this later. But anyways, in the Anglican order of salvation, he was baptized, he's regenerated and justified. He then grows in the Christian life through his natural earthly life, confirmation, partaking of communion, living the Christian life, and that prepares you for final justification at the last judgment, which then gives you access into the eternal kingdom. That's the Anglican order of salvation. It's taken from their Catholic roots, going back to the Middle Ages, clear back to Augustine and the Church Fathers. Okay. In this ordo, faith and good works were understood as not accruing merit, as in Catholic, as the Catholic Church taught about justification, but as fulfilling the conditions of gospel salvation. This is a key difference here in, in Anglican theology. Faith and good works do not accrue merit by which someone earns their salvation. They are conditions to be fulfilled. Conditions of the new covenant. Conditions of the gospel covenant. Conditions of salvation. By faith, we believe in Christ and receive initial justification. But when it talks about the last judgment and final justification, Scripture is very clear that we're going to be judged according to our works. Therefore, Anglican theology taught that we're saved by faith and good works in the big scheme of things. And assurance is grounded on a rational deduction of fulfilling these conditions. What this means is that in Anglican theology, back then in the 1700s, 1800s, if you were baptized, you were born again and a believer. You, were, you, were, you participated in the life of the church. You believed in Christ. You lived the Christian life. You could rationally draw the conclusion, I'm a Christian. That's what, and that's how they base their assurance on. They are fulfilling, they're living out the Christian life. Okay? It was in reference to final justification that high church Anglicans claimed that sanctification precedes justification. Jeffrey Chamberlain explains their rationale. Quote, since justification is not completed until it's determined that a person has met the conditions of faith and works, it could be said that sanctification preceded justification. That is, a person has to be made holy for his justification is complete and final at the last judgment. 
Since the sacrament of communion confers sanctifying grace to believers, that's Anglican theology, the sacrament of communion confers, conveys sanctifying grace in the life of the believer. John Wesley was a fervent believer that the sacrament of communion was essential, was a key part of growing as a Christian and overcoming sin and having a victorious life because God gives grace through the sacrament. So since the second communion confers sanctifying grace to believers, it too was seen by high churchmen as essential to maintain a state of justification in this life. In fact, John Wesley's father, Samuel, considered holy communion the primary means of grace in the believer's life. Not scriptures, not Christian fellowship, not worship, communion. That's how important they value in summary, Anglican High Church soteriology in the 18th century held a sacramental view of justification and the Christian life. Think about it. You're born again in baptism. You live the Christian life, growing as a Christian. But Holy Communion is the primary sacrament that by which you receive grace and fresh forgiveness in your life. All in preparation for final justification at the last judgment, which gives you entrance into the eternal kingdom. So you can see they had a sacramental view of justification and the Christian life that was basically Augustinian. And it was this viewpoint that was instilled in the young Wesley by his parents and education at the Charter House and Oxford. Taylor and Law. Beginning in 1725, Wesley's interest turned to the Anglican holy living tradition. And this produced a life-altering spiritual awakening in his life. Many see this as his conversion. But 1738 at Aldsgate was his evangelical conversion. Of the many authors Wesley read, two stand out as representative and influential to his doctrine of justification. Jeremy Taylor and William Law. Both were Anglican high churchmen, yet each stressed a distinct emphasis that supplied important concepts to Wesley's early understanding of righteousness. Wesley read several of Taylor's writings, but the one that engaged his attention the most was the rule and exercises of holy living and holy dying. Now, this was originally published as two separate books, Holy Living and Holy Dying, but by Wesley's day, they had been combined into one book. The book is best described as a discipleship manual in which Taylor advocates, quote, a rule and method approach to the Christian life. I mean, if you read the book, you will see very quickly, Taylor just gives a bunch of rules to live out. Okay? Richard Heitzenrader explains that Wesley adopted this distinctive approach during his spiritual awakening in 1725. And over the next several years, this method became the defining mark of Oxford Methodism, a disciplined and methodical approach to the Christian life. They kind of have all these rules, but they do not believe they were saved by these rules. That's, that is a mistake, a wrong interpretation. It's just an approach, an attitude, how they went about living the Christian life. Taylor's gospel stressed evangelical repentance. He was strong on repentance, holy living, and the conditionality of salvation within the Anglican Ordo Salutis. One of Taylor's fullest statements on justification and holy living and holy dying is found in the section on repentance. Now I'm going to read the paragraph here. It's quite condensed. Um, and, and it needs to be unpacked, uh, but it summarizes his understanding of justification. God changes also upon man's repentance, that he alters his decrees, revokes his sentence, cancels the bill of accusation, and throws the records of shame and sorrow from the court of heaven, and lifts up the sinner from the grave to life, from his prison to a throne, from hell and the guilt of eternal torture to heaven, and to a title to never-ceasing felicities or blessings. 
This quotation shows that Tater understood justification to include a cluster of blessings with the central idea that justification alters a person's standing before God. However, contrary to standard Reformed theology, Taylor did not believe these blessings were fully completed, fully realized in this life. As did other high church advocates, Taylor was Arminian and held a progressive view of repentance in the Christian life. Now this section I'm going to do, walk through here is very, very important to understand Taylor's theology. It begins in baptism, talking about repentance, continues through life, and is finished at death. Here we see the Anglican order of salvation, the order of salutis. Since repentance is a condition for forgiveness and is progressive through life, Taylor concluded that pardon is also partial and progressive through life. To illustrate, he pointed to Israel when time and again God forgave their sin of idolatry. In each instance, forgiveness applied to past conditions of idolatry. When Israel committed idolatry again, God visited upon them punishment that required fresh pardon. In the same way, evangelical forgiveness remains partial and progressive through life. God forgives when sin is forsaken, but future sin requires future pardon. A second related point is that the gift of pardon plays an essential role in the Christian sanctification. Taylor held that through the gift of pardon, God effectually imparts sanctifying grace and deliverance from sin. In other words, when God forgives a Christian of a sin, he doesn't just, you know, wipe away the guilt, but he also gives sanctifying grace through that act of forgiveness to strengthen the believer to overcome that sin and not commit it anymore. Taylor held that through the gift of pardon, God effectually imparts sanctifying grace and deliverance from sin. Evangelical forgiveness, therefore, does not consist merely of a secret sentence, word, or record, as the Calvinists taught, but effects a state of change that ultimately prepares the Christian for final justification. There's a lot here in this paragraph. You might want to go back and read through it slowly. In the end, Tater presented a high church Arminian alternative to the Puritan view that justification is complete and finished at the beginning of the Christian life. Tater's explanation of justification, his explanation of justification, had an immense influence on Wesley. Holy living and holy dying was instrumental to Wesley's spiritual awakening in 1725. And Taylor's method of rule and exercise set the direction for Wesley's religious pursuits and the Oxford Methodist program of holy living. Initially, Wesley questioned Taylor's concept of progressive pardon, having grown up believing that through the sacrament of communion, his, quote, preceding sins were ipso facto forgiven. On this point, he misunderstood Taylor, who also believed the sacrament confers pardon and sanctifying grace. But by 1730, Wesley would commend Taylor's association of forgiveness with sanctification and confess it represented one of the clearest explanations of pardon he had come across. Holy living was now firmly wedded to the early Wesley's doctrine of justification. From his diary, we learn that Wesley was reading William Law's A Serious Call to a Holy Devout Life by December 1730. Two years later, he perused Law's prior work, a practical treatise upon Christian perfection. Law's influence on Wesley was immense over the next several years, to the point that Wesley saw his counsel on spiritual matters and even tailored his ministry after Law's principles. One of those principles was to subsume justification in a new birth and sanctification to focus solely on the believer's inward renewal and holiness. 
in Law's two books here, Serious Call and A Practical Treatise on Christian Perfection, the focus is totally on inward renewal. His comments, I mean, it's hardly any comments about justification at all in, in either book. He makes few statements about the atonement and these, and these kind of issues. The focus is totally on the new birth. He has subsumed the justification in the new birth and focuses totally on our inner renewal in the image of God. Law considered Christ's death as a, quote, perfect, full, perfect, and sufficient sacrifice that ended the Old Testament sacrificial system and fully reconciles God to accept this upon the terms of the new covenant. What those terms are is seen in Law's, com Law's comments on baptismal covenant. William Law writes, No sooner are we baptized, but we are to consider ourselves as new and holy persons. That we that are uh, well, holy persons that are entered upon a new state of things, that are devoted to God, have renounced all to be fellow heirs with Christ and members of His kingdom. According to law, the Christian life does not consist merely of performing religious duties, but involves a life that is wholly devoted to God. This led to his next point. Whenever we yield ourselves up to the pleasures, profits, and honors of this life, that we turn apostates and break our covenant with God and go back on the express conditions in which we were admitted into the, the communion of Christ's church in baptism. With this one statement, Law declared baptized Christians to have lost their salvation when they turned to worldly pleasures. To be saved, these nominal believers had to renew their baptismal vow of full devotion, evidenced by self-denial and renunciation of the world. This rededication or single intention, law called the new birth, becoming a new creature and a conversion of the heart to God. Those converted were true Christians, pardoned and accepted, and on the path of renewal in the image of God. So Law drew a clear distinction between real Christianity and nominal Christianity. Nominal Christianity is Christianity in name only, mere profession. Uh, in England, 90% of the population was baptized members of the Anglican Church, but 90% of the population did not live sincerely for Christ. They were Christians in name only. They had renounced their baptism by turning to worldly pleasures. With this one statement, as I just stated, Law declared baptized Christians to have lost their salvation when they turned to worldly pleasures. And to be saved, these Christians in name only had to renew their baptismal vow, full devotion, evidenced by self denial and renunciation of the world. Two major themes in Law's writings. And of course, Law called this rededication the new birth, or we call it being born again, again, because people have lost their new birth in baptism. Law's impact on Wesley can be seen in two areas. This is very important. First, Law connects justification and new birth to conversion, adult conversion. As a result, Wesley reinterpreted his spiritual journey to assert that he had sinned away his baptismal regeneration as a child. He now considered his spiritual awakening in 1725 as his conversion. That's when he dedicated himself to God. And the moment of his justification and new birth. Although Wesley's views of gospel justification would change again in 1738 when he becomes born again under the ministry of the Moravians, he's going to change his views on the new birth and on justification. Law's influence was instrumental in preparing him for the Moravian ministry of free grace. Second, Law led Wesley to subsume justification in the new birth and sanctification. Years later, Wesley recounted that during his time at Oxford, 
He confounded justification with sanctification. And he had confused notions about forgiveness. Law's gospel of full devotion inspired Wesley to see inward holiness as the one thing needful. Therefore, gaining inward righteousness practically absorbed all his attention, as is evident in his Oxford sermons. Wesley through his sermons. The sermons serve as the primary source for the early Wesley's theology of salvation and the Christian life. The bicentennial edition of his works contains 17 sermons from the 12 year span, from 1725 to 1737. In these sermons, the focal point of righteousness is inward, on developing godly and holy character, not on the objective righteousness of justification. This concentrated interest in the interior work of the Spirit reflects the impact of holy living divines like Taylor and Law. Even though Wesley's focus in his sermons is on inward righteousness, in one sermon he did express his current doctrine of justification. In the landmark sermon, The Circumcision of the Heart, 1733, Wesley distinguished between present and final justification in the preamble. In this life, a true follower of Christ, writes Wesley, is in a state of acceptance with God. The present tense, the word is, conveys and he's referring to a believer's current standing before God. That is, they are already in a state of acceptance. Wesley then explains the believer's acceptance is not conditioned on anything external like baptism or any other outward form, but on a right state of soul. Law's influence is evident in these comments. Wesley proceeds to explain in section 1 that it is by faith that he believes that, um, excuse me, that it is by faith that believers see their calling is to glorify God by offering themselves entirely unto God as those that are alive from the dead. Thus believers are born of God and now do through God's grace the things that are acceptable in his sight. Moreover, faith does not lead the Christian hopeless, for it gives a joyous prospect of that crown of glory, here at the end, last judgment, which is reserved in heaven. So faith and hope lead to love in which every affection and thought and word and work terminates in God, who is the sole end as well as source of the Christian being. Wesley here links present justification, the believer's current acceptance to faith, assurance, new birth, and holy living. Since saving faith produces a holy life, a life that is acceptable to God, he could say that believers are justified by faith. In this way, Wesley expressed a mainstream high church understanding of justification by faith. There's a lot here. You might want to read back through this paragraph later on and unpack it. After discussing present justification, Wesley turns to final justification. The last judgment is when the true follower of Christ will receive God's public declaration of approval. Quoting Matthew 25, 23, Well done, good and faithful servant. Wesley encouraged believers to be content to wait for thy applause till the day of the Lord's appearing, when everyone receives their praise from God before the great assembly of men and angels. Here, typical Anglican expressions and concepts are employed to describe final justification at the last judgment. As Scripture abundantly teaches, this final declaration by God is conditioned upon good works as well as on faith. Towards the end of the sermon, Wesley repeated the Anglican position that faith is the foundation of good works 
and that the Holy Spirit is the inspirer and perfecter both of our faith and works. Insightful at this point is Wesley's appeal to the economic trinity to equitate this doctrine of justification. Throughout the sermon, the Father is the source and end of redemption. The Son purchased redemption by his atoning death, and the Spirit applies the benefits of redemption to believers for the renewal in the divine image. So central was this Trinitarian soteriology to Wesley's early theological vision that it left an indelible mark on his doctrine of justification. To explain this further, we turn to his devotional writings. A collection of forms of prayer. Around 1730, Wesley began to compile prayers and psalms for personal use in a notebook, which was common practice in Anglican piety. The psalms came from the Book of Common Prayer and the prayers from Anglican divines. The prayer manual what became a primary source for Wesley's first publication in late 1733, a collection of forms of prayer for every day in the week. The collection was designed for his students and fellow Oxford Methodists, and over the years, nine editions were produced. One feature that stands out in the collection is how the economic trinity affects our restoration in the Emmanuel Dei, including our justification before God. The opening prayer of the collection sets the Trinitarian agenda for the entire work. Wesley writes, Glory be to thee, O holy, undivided Trinity, for jointly concurring in the great work of our redemption and restoring us again to the glorious liberty of the sons of God. Here, Wesley suggests there is a perichoretic coactivity in which the three divine persons interpenetrate each other's redemptive activity in our renewal. Although our redemption is the work of the one undivided Trinity, the collection follows the pattern set by the Apostles and Nicene Creeds and assigns roles to the three divine persons. Father is Creator, Son is Redeemer, and Holy Spirit is Sanctifier. A, cl a closer look at these roles offers insights into the early Wesley's doctrine of justification. So we now we look at the role of the Father. As a sovereign God, the Father provides for our justification. He also serves as the primary authority in the pardon of sin. For nearly every petition for forgiveness in the collection is addressed to the Father. Moreover, this authority pertains to final justification. For it will be the Father who grants merciful acceptance in the last day through the merits of a blessed Son. That day would certainly be dreadful, yet believers would be shown mercy by the Father through the mediation and satisfaction of thy blessed Son, Jesus Christ. So within the economic trinity, it is the prerogative of the Father to pardon sin and at the final judgment to grant access into the everlasting kingdom. That's the Father's role in our justification. Now about the Son. Whereas the cross receives little attention in Wesley's sermons, the atonement emerges as central to the doctrine of justification in the collection and the manuscript prayer manual. The Son offered a, quote, full, perfect, and sufficient sacrifice for the sins of the whole world, whereby he merited for his people mercy, forgiveness, acceptance, and entrance into the eternal kingdom. In the prayer manual, Wesley repeatedly refers to the cross in substitutionary terms that continuously procures or merits pardon and sanctifying grace through the sacrament of communion. Presupposed in these comments is the Anglican doctrine of double justification. In the Friday morning prayers, Wesley opens the meditation 
on the Redeemer's life and passion by first offering praise to his divine personage. O oh, Savior of the world, God of God, light of light, thou art the brightness of thy Father's glory, the express image of his person. Be thou my light and peace. By beginning with Christ's deity before contemplating the depths of his passion, Wesley suggests that the sufficiency of the atonement is grounded on the intrinsic worth of the Son's divine person. In other words, the merit and value of Christ's passion for our justification rests on who he is that poured out his life for our redemption. The same prayer proceeds to a deeper consideration of the believer's death to sin. In the Wednesday prayer of mortification, Wesley includes a penetrating meditation on what it means to be planted together with thee in the likeness of thy death in order to be raised in the likeness of thy resurrection. Participation in Christ's death and resurrection puts to death the old life and imparts new life in Christ. The Holy Spirit, as the Spirit of Christ's passion and resurrection, enables believers to, quote, utterly destroy the whole body of sin so that they no longer live to the desires of men and instead pursue the will of God. Wesley has a strong doctrine of participation in the collection. The Spirit of Christ with believers enables them to declare, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. Let me just add that if we were unaware, and we were reading this, these statements of Wesley, we would be thinking that we're talking about the evangelical Wesley, the Wesley who's born again at all gate, who, who preaches the new birth and justification by faith in Christ. Here we have Wesley at Oxford, <laughs> the early Wesley, the Wesley, the high church Wesley, proclaiming a strong message of faith and participation in Christ's death and resurrection. And through that union with Christ, we die to sin and grow in the faith. We experience God's acceptance, His forgiveness in our lives, His justification. somehow. I'm missing page 11. Okay, I'm sorry about this. But it goes to 10, it goes to 12. And somehow the printer somehow missed page 11. I know that in the next paragraph, he talks about the Holy Spirit, okay? The role of the Holy Spirit. He talks about how the Holy Spirit is our enabler, our sanctifier. The Holy Spirit inspires us. The Holy Spirit breathes within us. He talks about the role of the Holy Spirit in, these, in this collection of prayers. And that the Holy Spirit, as the Spirit of Christ and the Spirit of the Father, applies the benefits of the work of the Father and the work of the Son in the life of the believer. And so Wesley really reflects the Western tradition when it comes to the filioque and that whole issue that separated West and East. He emphasizes as the spirit of the Father, he brings the Father's you know, declaration of pardon and forgiveness in our lives. As the spirit of Christ, he brings union with Christ's death and resurrection and the application of the atonement in our lives. So the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of the Father and the Spirit of the Son. Uh, top of page 12 here, it talks about the undivided trinity that's involved in our justification, which begins in baptism, continues in our sanctification, and is completed at the last judgment. Okay? I'm sorry I'm missing the page there. I can't off the top of my head recall everything that's on that page. Um, you can read the page uh, in that section of the lecture. And I know it talks about the role of the Holy Spirit. But we'll pick up here with the undivided trinity. 
and how Wesley has a, a strong economic view of the Trinity um, in relation to our justification. And this begins with the early Wesley. It really uh, continues through his entire ministry. Um, that he, the, the whole Trinity is plays a strategic role in our justification. Anyways, it begins at the top of page 12. The work of the Trinity begins in baptism. It continues in our sanctification and is completed at the last judgment. Once again, we have the Anakin Ordo Salutis. Fundamental to the Spirit's role is this procession, okay, as far as we remember, about the Father and the Son, the Philoque. In the collection, Wesley used a variety of verbs to describe the Spirit's activity. Um, he enables, inspires, assists, breathes, guides, aids, comforts, assures, unifies, and sanctifies. These internal actions bring the objective work of the Father and Son to fruition in the lives of God's people. As the Spirit of God and the Spirit of Christ, the Holy Spirit effectually applies the justifying, redemptive work of the Father and the Son to the hearts of the believers, effecting their recovery in the divine image. Thus, the Spirit's role in the perichoretic coactivity of the economic trinity is to internalize the promises and benefits of the new covenant established by the Father and mediated by the Son. We're down to closing thoughts. More space has been devoted to the collection because it spells out in sufficient detail the richness of Wesley's early doctrine of justification. Wesley's gospel was not shallow, nor did he consider salvation merited by good works. Remember, faith and good works are conditions. They do not accrue merit. Firmly anchored in the Anglican high church tradition and his doctrine of double justification, Wesley held that grace empowers a believer's renewal and righteousness and love with the eternal fellowship and happiness in God as the terminus ad quem the final goal of the renewal process. Early in life, Wesley was nurtured in the Anglican view of sacramental justification that reached back to Augustine. This sacramental view held that there are two definitive moments of justification for the believer, initial justification and at baptism and final justification at the last judgment. In between these two moments, the believer's acceptance is maintained by the sacrament of communion and living a life of faithfulness to the gospel covenant. As we saw, justification in a narrow sense means pardon and acceptance. But in a broader sense, justification includes membership in the new covenant, participation in the church as the body of Christ, union with Christ, and access or title to the eternal kingdom. The Anglican order of salvation, baptism, sanctification, final judgment, eternal glory, would continue to serve as the basic framework of Wesley's soteriology throughout his life. Likewise, the connection between justification and holy living finds its roots in Wesley's early period. Beginning in 1725, Wesley came under the influence of the Anglican holy living divine like Jeremy Taylor and William Law, who opened West's eyes to see the necessity of inward holiness for renewal in the image of God. But this also meant that holy living is necessary for a final justification at the last judgment. Although Wesley would later learn to distinguish between justification and sanctification, the conviction that inward holiness is necessary for a final salvation became permanently rooted in Wesley's soteriology at this time. Lastly, Wesley's early doctrine of justification finds its fullest expression in his devotional and sacramental writings. This is to be expected since he held a sacramental view of justification and the Christian life. It is in these writings that we learn that Wesley employed the economic trinity to expound his doctrine of justification, with the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit having distinct roles for our pardon and redemption. 
the economic trinity would continue to serve as the skeleton structure upon which Wesley would build his soteriology. One of the best summaries of these roles and of Wesley's early understanding of justification is found in the closing doxology of the covenant of forms of prayer. And here it is. Now, to God the Father, who first loved us and made us accepted in the Beloved. To God the Son, who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. To God the Holy Ghost, who sheds the love of God abroad in our hearts. Be all love and all glory in time and to all eternity. Amen. And with that, I will close. Thank you.